Well, today uh, we're going to look at Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Uh, we often call this the letter to the Colossians. And um, what, what I've noticed about the letter to, uh, to the Colossians is it's a lot like the other letters of Paul. It talks about the need for church unity, for the need for us all to come together under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and even in spite of our differences, to serve together for God's glory. Um, it talks about the prevalence of grace um, in our lives and, and how grace will always win and how grace is more important um, for us to focus on than the law and those kinds of rules that sometimes we get bogged down in. And Colossians also just talks about the love that God has for us um, through Jesus Christ. Um, like I said, in a lot of ways, it's, it's just uh, it's the same song, but a different verse of the story that we've been hearing and the things that we've been studying over the last several weeks. In fact, it's so similar to what we've been talking about and studying um, that there's been a part of me that thought maybe we shouldn't talk about it this week. That maybe um, we would go ahead and skip, uh, uh, skip Colossians uh, because it's so similar, especially to Ephesians. It's so similar to all those other books and all those other things that we've looked at that I wasn't sure I had anything to add to this particular book. But then two things happened. The first thing that happened was that I saw the video that you're gonna see in just a minute, and in that video, there was an invitation. And I took that invitation, and, and that invitation changed how I was reading I this letter. Right the second thing that happened was because I took that invitation and read the letter, I read something in the letter that had never jumped out at me before. This happens all the time for me when I read the Bible. It doesn't seem to matter how many times I read it. Um, when I read it with an open heart, there's always something new to be heard. And this time I heard something in a way that I've never heard before. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I wish I hadn't heard it. Because this is really hard. And it's really difficult. And there was a piece of me who thought, hey, maybe we just shouldn't talk about this today. Um, because it's so challenging and hard to wrap our minds around. But that's not what we do as a church, right? As a church, we're not afraid of the challenge, and we're not afraid to dig into God's Word, and we're not afraid to let it convict us, um, even though sometimes we just wish all it would do would comfort us, right? Well, um, let's get the journey started, because it's a journey worth taking, and, and we're going to hear our, in this short video introduction. Our, our plan through this series has been uh, to watch a 30-second video, and then I would talk for less than 30 seconds, which is where we get the name of the series, The Letters of Paul, in 3030. Um, today's video is over 30 seconds. I know it's over 30 seconds, so I, you, know, you can email me if you want to tell me it was over 30 seconds, but I already know. But I promise you I will take that amount of time off of what I want to say to kind of make sure we reach karmic balance in the universe. I really like this introduction to Colossians. I think it's really, it's very poetic. Uh, the person who wrote this is a person who's well clearly runs deep, and I really like the way he talks about Colossians. Um, so let's dive in and listen uh, to what he has to say. So the invitation here is to take the plunge. And, and what this author is saying and what I received as an invitation was that when it comes to reading the book of Colossians, the treasure isn't on the surface. The treasure is much deeper than that. And so in order to find the treasures that are in the book of Colossians, we've got to dig deep. And once we dig deep, what we're going to find is that there's a message that's calling us to open ourselves up to the mysteries and the call of God in a way that can change everything for us. Um, do you remember the first time you stood on a high dive? Anybody remember that? If you've ever done that before, it's pretty scary. Um, and the idea of taking that plunge has caused more than one young person, dare I say, even those of us who aren't so young, to turn around and say, no thanks, and go back down the way we came up. If we want to think about taking the plunge into the words that we're about to hear from Colossians, we're going to have to get over some fears. We're going to have to be willing to take some risks, and we're going to have to be willing to dive in deep. I think that if we do that, we might find that there's some real life to be found there. That there's this hope that comes through Jesus Christ that Paul describes in this book. A hope that comes from the firstborn of all creation. That God is a part of everything and God is in everything and God is through everything. 
That when you experience blessings, Jesus' fingerprint is on every good thing and every blessing that you have. And when you experience hardships and darkness and challenges, even the most evil thing you can ever imagine, Christ is not away from you, but Christ is there. And there is this hope that can guide you, as Scripture says, even through the darkest valley. A hope that if we can find it and if we can claim it, it will cling to us like tomatoes clinging to the vine on a hot July day that's just saturated with humidity. I want us to take a bite of that fruit. Because when we do so, the rewards will be so nutrient-rich and so sweet that it will give us a life unlike any other. But in order to do that, according to Paul, um, we're going to have to become aware of some temptations that we have as a people of faith. Temptations to buy into arguments and ideas and thoughts and beliefs that are going to pull us away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing about these beliefs. These teachings, these thoughts, these ideas that exist out there that can pull us away from Jesus Christ, they're very tempting. And it's very easy to succumb to them. Paul begins his argument uh, in the second chapter of Colossians about this temptation with these words. He says, I'm saying this so that no one may deceive you with plausible arguments. And, and this is what stood out to me in my later readings and deeper readings of this letter. I want you to focus on the last two words. Plausible arguments. Paul's not worried about theological flights of fancy. Paul's not worried about a pie in the sky, easy, cheapskate theology. He's not interested in any of that. He doesn't think we're in the end going to succumb to foolishness if we stay mature in faith. That's not his concern here. His concern is that we're going to fall victim to the arguments that are perfectly plausible. The arguments that absolutely make sense. He says it's those arguments that are the ones that are going to pull you away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you need to be very careful because they can get you. He continues, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. According to the elemental, the earthly, the, the physical, the, the material spirits of the universe. And not according to Christ. What Paul is tapping into here is something that I think to some degree we've all experienced. He's saying, look, there are some human traditions that are out there. The way that we live our everyday lives that all of us not only not just take for granted, we see as the wise way of living. There are times when those human traditions, those, those common sense things, bump up against the teachings of faith in a way that cause us to have to make a choice. Are we going to choose the things of this world, the human traditions that make sense, the human traditions that we know will work, the plausible things of life? Or are we going to choose the higher things? That's what Paul calls them in Colossians. Keep your eyes focused on the heavenly things. Are we going to choose those things even though there are very clearly times when the teachings of Christ, when the teachings of God that come to us in Scripture, when we think about living into those things in this world, they are absolutely implausible. Let me explain what I one day Jesus was teaching and, and all these people, they were following him and they said to him, hey, we want to be your disciples. And Jesus said, hey, that's great. But if you want to be a disciple of mine, you're going to have to count the cost. This isn't a cheap and easy ride. It's really pretty difficult. Um, if you were going to build a house, you would make sure you had all the materials and that you could afford it and you wouldn't just start building a house without a plan. you got to know what it costs and what it's going to take. If you were a ruler and you were going to go off to a battle, you've got to know what resources you have. You're not just going to lead without your full army and your full supplies and all those kinds of things. And if you don't think there's a chance of winning, you're not going to go. No one steps into anything without taking full consideration of all the costs. Now, if you want to be a disciple, you have to understand that there are some costs involved. 
And the first thing he says to them is, if you want to follow me, you have to be willing to leave your family, your parents. Your partner, your spouse, your, your children. You've got to be able to leave your family. And then he says to them, and this is really hard. He says, if you aren't willing to do that, you cannot be my disciple. He doesn't say you shouldn't be my disciple or it's going to be hard for you to be my disciple or you're really not going to be a full-time disciple. No, no. He says, if you can't leave your family, you cannot be my disciple. Then, as if that wasn't hard enough, he said, if you're not willing to pick up your cross and carry it every single day. And what he means by that, you know, you know what they use crosses for, right? You know how the story ends. It, if you're not willing to pick up that cross and carry it every day, which means that you're willing to die for your faith and you're willing to suffer for following Christ, you cannot follow me. If you're not willing to do that, he says to them, if you're not willing to die, you cannot follow me. And then he said, and if you're not willing to give up all of your possessions, every single thing that you own, you cannot follow me. Now, do you think that leaving your family, subjecting yourself to death, and giving away everything that you own sounds like a plausible path for your life. Those things are absolutely implausible in the real world. You know what else Jesus teaches? We're just getting started. Um, any of you have 401ks, retirement plans? Um, Jesus teaches very clearly, you are not to store up for the future. You're not to do that. Um, if you want to follow me, no pensions, no retirements, no 401ks. I have a church-sponsored pension plan, which seems completely oxymoronic um, given the teachings of Jesus Christ, right? But if we want to follow Jesus, we can't do those things. In the real world, that's implausible. Jesus teaching, Jesus teaches that we have to give to every single person who begs to us. We cannot say no. Jesus teaches us that if we're ever sued, we not only give that which we are sued um, for, we give more. Jesus teaches that if anyone asks us if they can borrow money from us, even if they're our enemy, we're supposed to lend them that money and then get this, not ever expect to be paid back. Implausible. Absolutely implausible. Jesus teaches that if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn your left cheek so they can strike you there too. He says you're not only supposed to pray about your enemies, you're supposed to love your enemies. And then Paul takes it a step further and says you're not even just supposed to love your enemies, but if your enemy is hungry and thirsty, you're supposed to give your enemy food and water because evil cannot overcome evil. Only love can conquer evil. In today's world, given the enemies that we face, would you see that response as plausible or implausible? There's a lot of things about the Word of God that sound really implausible when it comes to living them out in our daily lives. And, and I've heard from you and I have said myself that that's great that that's what Jesus says, and I get that's what Jesus says, but in the real world, if we live like Jesus taught us to live, we would get crushed. It's absolutely implausible to do everything He has called us to do. And you know what? You're right. It is implausible. My mind has been racing this week. And I have been working overtime to try to figure out the escape clause for this. <laughs> Not because I just want to let you off the hook, but because I want to let me off the hook. This is hard. And it's really, really challenging. And as I sat down and, and, and really considered what this means for us and what it means for me, and I, and I started looking at that list of all the implausible teachings of Christ and all the plausible reasons why we shouldn't do it, even though Paul is saying, be careful, 
Because human traditions are pulling you away from the gospel and it's a, there's perfectly plausible reasons for that to happen and that's the danger. I started to realize that the problem wasn't with Jesus' teaching. There's no problem with the Word of God and how the Word of God calls us to live our lives. There's, there's no real problem with that. The, the problem, even though it's challenging and, and improbable, the real problem is with us. And let me just say, for me, the real problem is with me. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to really live the way Jesus calls me to live. I'm afraid not to store up for my retirement. I'm afraid to live my life in a way that might negatively impact my family and my children. I'm afraid to live my life in a way that might put me or someone I know and love at personal rest. I'm afraid to live into the gospel the way Jesus has called me to live into the gospel. And part of my fear is preventing me from picking up my cross and carrying it daily. There is no doubt about that. I am absolutely terrified of what Jesus is asking me to do. And so what I tend to do and what I know that sometimes you tend to do is we, we argue all that stuff away. And we say that's not what he means. It's a different world. We got to do what we got to do, and God will understand, and everything will be okay. And this is how this has to work. And, and you know what that is? It's, it's not just fearful thinking, it's arrogant thinking, and it's thinking that minimizes the gospel. This is really scary. And, and here's the other thing. Even though I'm a preacher and a pastor and I'm called to, to preach to you and tell you to live into the teachings of Jesus Christ, I am not going to tell you to give up your 401k. I'm not going to tell you to abandon your family. I'm not going to tell you to sell everything you own for the sake of the gospel. I'm not going to tell you to, live your, to leave your home and live as a homeless person. I'm not going to tell you to, to travel to the far reaches of the earth and, and give food and water to our enemies. I'm not going to tell you to do that. And you know what? If I did, it wouldn't matter because you wouldn't do it anyway. Right? Neither would I. So what do we do with this? Because here's this really weird place in our faith where we know that we're not living into the teachings of Jesus Christ and into the Word of God. And we know we're not. And we've justified it. And how have we justified it? with a whole heap of plausible arguments, right? Which is exactly what Paul warned the early church about, and it's exactly what Paul was warning us about. Those implausible arguments are not going to destroy your faith. What's going to destroy your faith and what's going to hurt the church is when you start following plausible arguments and making plausible reasons for why you don't fully live into the gospel. Are you uncomfortable yet? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is hard. But we, I think we just need to live in this tension. I don't have this figured out. I don't have a solution for you. But sometimes my role as pastor isn't to provide the solution, but to make sure that we're asking the questions and to make sure that I'm not letting you off the hook because, because I get worried about this. Do you know what Jesus said will happen at the end of time for people? That when we get to that point at the end of our lives, at the end of our days, and we go before Jesus, there's going to be a separation of people. And half of, and, and part of the people are going to be sheep, and, and part of the people are going to be goats. Do you remember which one you want to be part of? <coughs> it's a sheep. I don't know why goats are bad. I, I don't. Uh, but, but we want to be sheep. And do you know what the difference is between being a sheep and being a goat? Doing what Jesus called us to do. And he says very clearly, if you don't do these things, when the day comes and you cry out, Lord, Lord, my response is going to be, I do not know you. Get away from me. And, and you know what our, often, our response often is to that? When we think about the idea of us, we love Jesus, we're deeply faithful, we care about God, we want to do the best things in our life. This is what we think. We think when we get to that moment that we're going to be sheep, right? And what do we think about the possibility that God may say, when we cry out, Lord, Lord, that God may say, get away from me, I do not know you. And that God says, you're a goat. How do we feel about that possibility? Completely improbable. Not going to happen to me. 
But what if Jesus meant what he said, and what if Paul meant what he said? What does that mean for us? Well, there, there's, a couple, there's a couple things that I, that I really want us to do, and that I want us to try to come away from this conversation with. And the first is just a spirit of acknowledgement and confession. It's where we are. I, I guarantee that for every one of us here, there's an implausible teaching of faith that we've talked ourselves into not having to follow because it's, it's so wrong for the modern world. We know that. We, we just got to own that. We got to confess that. Because every one of us is doing it to some degree. We've all got it. Um, we just, first, first step is to say, yeah, that's me. The second step, and Paul talks about this in a, in a pretty clear way in Colossians. Don't minimize the improbable by elevating the problem. And this is what I mean by that. We minimize the hard teachings of faith and the improbable teachings of faith because we know we can't live into them, and so we explain them away and we bring them down. And then the ones that we can live into, the probable teachings of faith, we lift those things way up. And we really start to focus on those things. But what's challenging about that is what's probable and easy for me to live into may be very improbable and difficult for you to live into. But if I think it's easy and I look at you and you're not doing it, then I can have a very judgmental view of you and your lack of living into what is so probable in our faith. The other thing that, that I really want to encourage you to remember is that no teaching in faith is meant to take life from us. We're not being punished by God. God loves us so deeply and so passionately that God gave God His life for us. God, God's not calling us in a way that would strip our life away from us, but in a way that would give us life. Every teaching that God gives us is so that we can have a better life, a freer life, a richer life, a more abundant life. All of those teachings are for all of that. God's not, God's not trying to keep us down. God's trying to lift us up. I want you to think about the story that is at the heart of our faith. The story of a man who came to live on this earth who was not just human, but was God in the flesh. The Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, came to live among us and teach us and love us. Be killed on a cross. Be placed in a tomb where he lay dead for three days, to be raised up from the dead by the power of God through the resurrection, to be lifted up into heaven for the promise of eternal life, not just for him, but for us. I want you to think about the probability of that story. It is the most improbable story in all of human history. But we know it's true. Because we know that we worship a God that is able to make the improbable probable and to give us life where there was once death. We know this, and so we are no longer afraid of death. But we are afraid of not having a retirement plan. Right? I wonder. I just, I wonder what our lives would look like if we would just take the leap. To start to live into the improbable graces of God in a way that can change everything for us. When I look at my own life and I look at like the, what, what that means for me, the realities of that, I'm going to be honest with you and I'm going to tell you that those realities feel like they are a long way away. They don't feel near at all. And I've got some serious work in order to get to that place. And the thought of it absolutely scares me to death. Do you remember the saying, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. One step. For me and maybe for you, the thought of actually getting to the destination is so frightening that I won't even start walking. Paul calls the church in Colossians and calls us to take a step. To believe that the treasure is beneath the surface and to go deep. I cannot walk alone. And I know that you can't either. My hope is that together we will just start walking. And that we will trust that as improbable as it sounds, there is a great reward 
waiting for us on the other side of the journey. Amen.